So how does this get reflected in Aeschylus' Persians? The Persian is the earliest Greek tragedy we've got, and it's the only one actually on a historical theme, and it's very remarkable indeed. It was first produced in 472 BCE, which is only uh, seven or eight years after the final uh, Persian invasion had uh, been defeated at the Battle of Plataea and had had to flee Greece. So this is rather like somebody making a war film in, say, 1953, or 1952, um, about the last days of the German Reich in 1945. It's very immediate memory, and the Greeks, of course, in the audience, Aeschylus's audience, are feeling very, very relieved that they won. Athens had actually been raised to the ground by the invading Persians, and they want to celebrate their as they saw it, enormous triumph over the Persian invading enemy. So it is a deeply patriotic piece, and it's designed to celebrate the Athenian victory. It's actually set in Persia, where the news first comes that the Persians have lost the war, and then Xerxes himself returns, a very bedraggled figure, having lost a huge number of his army and his men, and he returns home to the palace and to his mother, uh, to a very uh, unenthusiastic reception by the per chorus of Persian old men, elders, who couldn't fight because they were too senior. But in this play, there is a considerable amount of detail about Persian lifestyle. Aeschylus really tries hard to invent a theatre language in which to portray these very different people in their very different environment. And he does this in several ways. They actually call themselves barbarians, which is very, very odd, because, of course, the Persians wouldn't have called themselves barbarians. They say things like, all the barbarian country, we are singing in lament. All us barbarians are feeling great loss and pain. Then he uses a sort of soundscape. He uses some slightly Persian-sounding words. So the Persian language, for example, had a lot of A sounds in it. So instead of saying dareios, which is the Greek for Darius, they go, Darian, a lot of very big open A sounds. They have different costumes. They talk about their long costumes and their elaborate slippers, which the Greeks found very strange. They tended to wear sandals or go around in bare feet. And they talk about their tiara, which isn't like what we call a tiara. It's actually a peaked cap, and you can see it on all the artworks on the syllabus for the Persian king, because it's um, sometimes upright and sometimes down, depending on the particular moment in the ceremonial. They have a slightly different religion. Basically, they do talk about the Greek gods, like the Zeus, but there's also some strange spirits they talk about, and they're very, very interested in light and dark, which is part of the Zoroastrian religion, which is a religion that we know they practice, which is completely different from uh, Olympian religion of the Greeks. And they do some court customs. For example, the chorus perform prostration before the Queen of Persia when she comes on, and like and rolling out the big salam, which is a very powerful stage image. And the Persians thought this was a terrible thing that the Persians did it before ordinary humans because the Greeks only did it before gods. So we have a lot of very rich ethnographic, that's called, that ethnos, which just means a, an ethnic group. Uh, we have ethnographic material in that play, um, and we also have implicit celebration of the Athenian and the Greek way of life. When it comes to Euripides' Medea, however, we have really rather the opposite. Now, this is 431 BCE, so that's 41 years later. And in Euripides' Medea, we have not on a whole barbarian caste, because the Persians are all Persians, in their Persian court, you know, we time and space travel to the court in the Persian Empire eight years previously. Euripides Medea is set in Corinth in the Bronze Age, hundreds of years before the time of the play, but it has this very powerful figure of Medea herself who's come all the way from the Black Sea, from Georgia, modern Georgia, which is right in the east southeastern corner of the Black Sea, now, it was a land that the Greeks and the Athenians in the audience did sail to. They did business there. They got slaves from there. They got gold from there. They got fish from there. But they thought that it was actually 
basically the last outpost of civilization. They didn't realize yet that there were far, far, far more um, in Asia um, if you went ever further eastward. So it was sort of the last place that they went. So Medea is regarded as a very exotic, as a very strange figure. Uh, the vocabulary used of her implies that she's hyper intelligent, that um, you know, she, she boasts about her skills in um, pharmaceuticals with drugs. She's got some supernatural powers. One thing that does make her ethnographically slightly different from the uh, Greeks, like Jason and Creon the king, is, and the chorus of Corinthian women, is that she uh, has a very special relationship with the sun, that's her grandfather, and the Greeks tended to think that sun and moon worship was rather a strange, barbarian thing at this time. And she also prays to Hecate, who is uh, the underworld goddess of witchcraft, which is not something that people tend to do in Greek tragedy, which is very much about the Olympian religion. But otherwise, she speaks perfect Greek, there's no soundscape, there's no different attempt to make her language sound any different, there's not even any discussion of her wearing different clothes or uh, um, having a different mask. That's despite the fact that Herodotus says that Colchians had dark skin. We're given no indication that she's any darker than the Greeks. And she also um, very very knowledgeable about the Greek way of life, and I very much doubt if she was played with a foreign Georgian Colchian accent. Colchis is, is the city that she's uh, originally from, up the river Phasis, which is now called the Rioni. Now Medea, however, does use the polarisation, the conceptual division between the Greek world and the barbarian world all the time. So instead of ethnographic material, what we've got is a very, very heightened self-conscious use of this new language, which had only been invented 50, 60 years before with hatred against the Persians. Um, she and Jason use it constantly against each other in different ways. So Jason says things like, uh, you're sex mad like all barbarian women, or you should be grateful I brought you here to a civilised country and got you free of that terrible barbarian one, all right? So he is using straightforward, crude, we would call it racism, to divide his world as, as superior from hers. But she's not having any of that because she absolutely, although she's a terrible person who ends up committing murder and destroying perfectly innocent uh, people in the princess and uh, her two children, and up to a point with King Creon, though his innocence is something we could question. She knows that Jason is morally in the wrong by having broken his vows. She knows he's broken the vows. She talks constantly about Zeus, who's the god that you swore oaths to, and Themis, who's justice, the, the justice that looks after oaths. And she inverts it, and she makes Jason out to look like the savage. She manages to get Jason to seem, especially to the Corinthian women chorus, like the bad behaved, immoral, unjust, depraved, cowardly one. So she actually turns that rhetorical trick of his, which is you're just a barbarian and we all know Greeks are superior, on its head. And that is why that is so important to that play. We do have a direct confrontation between people from two cultures, but I think it's much more important actually that they're co-parents and have been passionate lovers and they're married than that one is Greek and one is barbarian. This play says and talks race, but actually is not. It's about sex and power and parenthood. Thank you very much.